You know, the truth is, friends, that we all believe something about a place called heaven. Now, some people believe that heaven doesn't really exist or it's not actually a place. Other people believe that almost everyone goes to heaven. Some people believe that they already have friends and family who are in heaven. But most everybody hopes to go to heaven one day. I personally have never in my life met anyone who says, nah, I'm good, thanks, I'll choose the other place. Everybody wants to go to heaven. And we've been learning in this series a lot about this place called heaven. We've been learning some basic facts about it, who's there and how we can know we'll be there one day. We, we've been learning and studying what those in heaven do and what we should do now, what, what we can expect while waiting for heaven. And so today, I want to talk with you about getting ready for heaven. In fact, since everyone wants to go to heaven, we've got to get ready for heaven. And if you haven't already done so, go ahead and open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And now if you do not have a hard copy of the Word of God, but you've got an electronic device or a smartphone or a tablet, go ahead and power it up. And hopefully you got the Bible app or the church app on it. As I like to say, open or swipe to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've got free Wi-Fi at both of our campuses. Those of you up in our Highlands campus, so excited. I know you're pumped to have Pastor Jeff and several members that traditionally attend our Highlands campus back with you today for from Guatemala. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me ask you a question. How long did it take you to get ready for church today? Uh, let me ask it this way. How, if you came with somebody to church, maybe, you know, with a spouse or with a family member or a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, how many of you would say it took them longer than it did you to get ready for church today? Guys, do not raise your hand. What are you doing? I mean, I know Valentine's Day just ended, but come on, don't raise your hand, right? You know, if I would say, how long does it take you to get ready to go somewhere, you'd probably say, well, it depends where I'm going, Pastor Kevin. I mean, if I was going just to the grocery store, you know, it might be I throw on some sweat, so I throw on some jeans and a T-shirt. But if I was getting ready to go on vacation, maybe to a, the beach for a week, you know, it might take a little longer, right? I, I got to think of everything I've got to bring with me and pack. And since we all want to go to heaven, and it's a long trip, the Bible tells us what we need to know to get ready for heaven. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to start reading in verse 35. Now I want to tell you, uh, especially the first part of this passage as we read the rest of the chapter, uh, he's using several illustrations to help us get ready for heaven. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. The stars differ from star in splendor, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after that, the spiritual, the first man was of the dust of the earth and the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are from heaven. 
And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the the perishable inherit the imperishable. Verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, when when we think about getting ready for heaven, on your message note, I just want to give you right from the beginning today, the entire thought of today's talk, the entire thought of today's message, here it is on your handout, what you believe about heaven, whatever it is, what you personally believe about heaven will determine how you live. What you believe about heaven will determine how you live. You live. And in this passage, what he's telling us, number one on your handout, there is a prerequisite for heaven. There is a prerequisite for heaven, and that prerequisite is change. Even though Hebrews 13 reminds us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus said in Matthew 18, unless you change you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. To get to heaven, that's what we're talking about, getting ready for heaven. To get to heaven, verse 51, one of the basic prerequisites, we will be changed. And then he repeats it in verse 52, we will be changed. You see, when we think about how we're going to get to heaven, it's going to happen one of two basic ways. A, This can come as the result of death. But he reminds us in this passage that even though some of us will not die, most of us will. Now, let's think about it this way. Number one, what do we know about death? Just some basic thoughts. What do we know about death? On your handout, death is certain. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, it is appointed unto man wants to die. The studies are very conclusive. Approximately one out of one people die. The death rate in America is right at 100%. We don't like to talk about it much. It's not a pleasant subject. But the fact is, friends, one day I'm going to die. And one day you're going to die. Unless Jesus Christ returns in your lifetime or mine, we are all going to die. It is a sure bet. It's not a probability. It is a certainty. We will all, as Psalm 23 says, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. One day you and one day me, we will leave this earth. So last night, I'm doing my normal Saturday night routine, and I'm preaching my message to my dining room table. Every Saturday night, I preach to my dining room table. Now, some Saturdays, it gets right with God. Some Saturdays, it doesn't, okay? But I kind of go through the message before I go to sleep Saturday night. So there I am, and I'm going through the message, and I get to this exact point, and I get a text message from one of our members He told me that his father just had a massive heart attack and died, and he would have been sitting right there today. They'd had a family gathering. They had celebrated and walking to the truck. Instantly, he passes away. Death is certain. 
And if we're honest on your handout, we all kind of fear it, don't we? We all kind of fear death. Why is that? Well, verse 26 in this passage reminds me that it's an enemy. You see, number one, it's the way God made us. Remember, we were never created to die. A death was never part of God's plan. But you know the story. Adam and Eve took the fruit they weren't supposed to take. They sinned, and as a result, death entered the equation. And sin brings death, and death is a result of sin. We fear it. It's just the way God made us. Number two, it's an unknown. Even though for a believer, death is always in the Bible spoken of as a comforting thing. Uh, That's why for a believer, listen, if you've lost someone recently, it's not goodbye, it's see you later. So last night as I'm talking to this gentleman on the phone who just lost his father, and he said to me, you know, Pastor Kevin, you've been preaching on heaven. And I said to my dad a few weeks ago, It was one of those days you were saying, do you know that you know that you know that you know that you know you're going to heaven? And he said, Pastor Kevin, we really never talked about it. And so that way, I walked in the car, I go, Dad, do you know? And he said, yes, son, I know. I made a commitment to Jesus. You know the hope and the peace that brings when you know where your loved one is one day? You see, uh, Philippians 1, Paul says, For a believer, death is gain. He says we're torn between the two. There's a part of us, once we know Christ, we want to go on to heaven and be with Jesus and all those that have went on before and our friends and family, but there's a part of us that that we're torn. We want to stay here. And 1 Thessalonians says that when we lose someone, we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. We can have hope even though we're all going to die. Number three, I think we fear it because we have a fear of judgment. Even though God in Psalm 103 reminds us he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Even though Hebrews 10 reminds us the blood of Jesus, we can have confidence that we're going to heaven. We can draw near to God. Even though 1 John 1, 7 says the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sins. Even though 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even though 1 John 2, 28 says we shouldn't be ashamed When we face him, if we're honest, all of us kind of fear judgment. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit. But what happens at death? Number two, just basic, what happens when someone dies? Well, first of all, the body and soul separate. Can I remind you today that this is not all you are? Hallelujah, by the way. Right? Remember we studied how God created man in his image. What's that mean? Just like God is three in one. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's created us as body, soul, and spirit. Your spirit, that's kind of who you are. That's your personality, your emotions, if you will. Your body, we know that. And your soul is what goes on and lives forever. Now, we're to be good stewards of what God has given us. We're to take care of this body. The Bible does talk against gluttony, but he reminds us that no matter what we do to take care of this, verse 47, look at it, we're just dust. But look at verse 36. God has given us a body, I like this, just as he Determined. Now, again, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of it, but it does, it should affect our self-image, how we view ourselves, that God has given me a body just as he determined. So it's Valentine's Day, and if you're a guy, you felt pressure. What am I going to do for my Valentine? And so I came up with an idea this year. I said, I know what I'm going to do for my Valentine. I'm going to take Terry skiing. We hadn't been snow skiing in a while. It's been years. Matter of fact, most of you, if you're on social media, you probably already saw the pictures. And so what we did is Thursday, after she got done with preschool, she teaches in the preschool here, and uh, we go up to West Virginia, and we stay at a resort, and we have a nice dinner Thursday night because every smart man knows you do not celebrate Valentine's Day on Valentine's Day. Hallelujah. 
Just like you don't celebrate Mother's Day on Mother's Day. What's wrong with you, all right? So we go to another day and we celebrate. And, and then on Friday, it's Valentine's Day. We're going to ski. We haven't been skiing in years. So we're, man, it's all coming back to us. We're doing good. About three hours in, Terry says to me, you know, we're going to feel this in the morning. And I'm thinking, feel this in the morning? What's she talking about? I'm pretty tough. Well, that was Friday. I didn't feel it in the morning. I'm still feeling it today. I don't know if you noticed when I walked up here, but I think I'm going to pull the muscle in my leg, all right? Why? Because my body is deteriorating. And think of it this way. Your shirt that you're wearing right now, if you would look on the tag, it would probably say made in, made in China, made in Indonesia, made in America. How many of you got up, I know what you did, you got up this morning after you did your half a sit-up for the day? You know, tonight you're going to do the other half. <laughs> That's one. Right? You did your half sit-up this morning, you staggered over into the mirror, you turned on the light of the bathroom like I did this morning, you looked in the mirror and you went, made in the image of God. See, this body is called our tent, our outer covering. It is the house for the real you. It's not the real you because this body is changing. This body has changed. This body will change because change is a prerequisite for heaven. Whenever you die, we don't like to think about it, but whenever you die, somebody will meet with a funeral home and they will plan your service and they will pick out your casket and you will still be alive. Look at the verse on your handout. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What happens after death? The body and soul separate on your handout. We go, circle this word, immediately to heaven or hell. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. There is no holding place. There is no temporary dwelling. The Bible does not teach purgatory. Remember, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and the thief next to him repents. And Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. In Luke 16, the rich man died, and immediately he goes to hell. When we die, we immediately go to heaven or hell. We talk a lot here at the church how God is the God of a second chance, but not after we die, after we die, our eternal destiny is set. The biggest misconception people have about heaven is, number one, that everybody goes. The second biggest misconception people have about heaven is that when we die, we'll stand before God and God will decide at that moment whether we go to heaven or hell. That's not what the Bible teaches. That is decided now based on what we do with Jesus, whether we accept him as our savior or in effect reject him. Well, what happens at death? What happens? The body and soul separate. We immediately go to heaven or hell. And thirdly, we face judgment. There's something inside of us all that we know deep down we're going to have to answer for the way we live. And remember, what you believe about heaven will determine how. You live. And it's a sobering thought, judgment. We don't talk about it much. But what happens at judgment depends upon what you did with Jesus in life. Now, remember, the judgment is not to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. No, that's determined now while you're on earth. You see, the good news of the gospel is that God loves you. The most famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world, that's you. That's me, that he gave his one and only son. That whoever, that's you, that's me, believes on him, should not perish but have everlasting life. But the problem is we've got the same disease and it's terminal and it's called life. And the Bible says as we go through life, all of us, if we're honest, have broken God's laws. And the Bible has a big fancy word for it. It's called sin. And the Bible says the wages, the result of my sin is death. In hell. But that's why God sent Jesus, who died on the cross, was buried, rose from the dead. And because of that, because of that, 
No matter how messed up your life is, listen to me, listen, listen, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, God's grace and forgiveness is available for you today. And God has brought you here. At this moment, he slowed you down enough in your crazy, busy life to tell you I love you and I want to know you. I want a relationship with you. And I believe today that someone listening or watching will receive God's grace. I believe today that some of you are going to turn from your sin. You're never going to be the same. God's going to cast your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. You're going to hear his voice. Your name is going to be written in the Lamb's book of life. And when that happens, if you die for the believer, number one, we go to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, again, this doesn't determine whether I get into heaven or not. It determines the amount of rewards, if any, I'll receive. We studied this on Wednesday night in our series, Questions About Heaven. And if you've been missing them, I encourage you to check out the church's YouTube channel. All the teaching is there. Now, number two, for unbelievers, when they die, they stand before the great white throne judgment where God reveals to them that he had a place for them in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life, but they didn't accept it. So they're judged to show the degree of punishment in hell. What is the prerequisite for heaven? Change. A, this could come as a result of death. B, this can come as a result of the return of Jesus. That's what he says in verse 51. We will be changed. Now, if you'll hold your finger here and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul introduces this concept that Jesus is going to return again. Uh, You might have heard of this event called the rapture. And what he does in 1 Corinthians 15, he just expounds on it. But in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. With a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's where we get the word rapture in the Latin. We'll be raptured up together. We'll be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. When first Corinthians 15, he just gives us some more details. Look what he says. Number one, he says about the return of Jesus, it's a mystery. Look at verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. Do you know the rapture of the church was a mystery? The Old Testament believers didn't know about it. Daniel didn't know about it. Isaiah, Abraham, Jacob, even Moses. We studied last week about how Jesus taught on the secrets to the kingdom of heaven. Now Paul is saying Jesus is going to return and this is a mystery of the people of this day. It's a secret, but it's a secret no more. Paul is spilling the beans. Jesus is going to return. And he says, number two, it's a miracle. Look at verse 51. We will not all sleep. Now, the word sleep in the Bible is an illustration. It's a euphemism for death. Because not to be insensitive, but if you've ever been to a viewing, a person that's in the casket looks like they're sleeping. It's a miracle. What's the miracle? On your handout, we will not all die. We just read in 1 Thessalonians 4, some believers will be taken directly to heaven when Jesus returns, verse 51, and we will be changed. All believers on your handout will be changed and will be like Jesus. Now, people today have a lot of questions about heaven, just like the people in this day. And in verse 35, they ask Paul this question, how are the dead raised? 
what kind of body will they come? In other words, what are we going to look like in heaven? Are we going to know one another in heaven? Are we going to recognize one another in heaven? Are you going to be you? Am I going to be me? Are we all just going to be shiny like we think the angels are? Are we all going to be the same? What does he tell us? He, he says, yes, we're going to know one another. Yes, I'm going to be me and you're going to be you. Yes, we're going to receive a new glorified body that will be perfect, no more pain, no more hurts, but I will be me and you will be you. We will recognize one another. We will know one another, but remember, we won't have the same earthly relationships with one another. We won't be married. We won't be parent and child or pastor and congregate. And as far as our bodies, what they're going to be like, Paul gives us an illustration in verse 36 and verse 37. He says, it's like a gardener. If you're planting a garden and you put a seed in the ground, what seems to be decaying is actually paving the way to more life. Will we all be alike in heaven? Will our glorified bodies be all alike? No. In verse 38 through verse 41, he says, just like there's different seeds and different celestial bodies, when we get to heaven, we will maintain our own identity. We will be different. God loves variety. The book of Revelation talks about people from every nation, every tribe, every language group, every ethnicity around the throne. We'll know each other. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus revealed his glory and Moses and Elijah shows up and Peter, James, and John are there. Moses was Moses, Elijah was Elijah, and Jesus, even though he's transfigured and had all his glory, he was still Jesus. They were recognized, you will be you, I will be me, we will be like Jesus. Look at the verse on your handout. Dear friends, now we're children of God. That's the key, are you? Once we're a child of God, once we've received him as Savior, what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't know all the details, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Philippians 3, Jesus will transform our earthly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. Think what people do to transform their body today. Athletes try to lift weights to transform their body. People try to work out. They don't eat certain foods. People take vitamins. Some people, in an effort to transform their body, even take steroids or have plastic surgery. But it doesn't matter what we're doing. All of us feel pain. All of us, as we go through life, we are perishing. We are, in effect, dying, he says. Think about it. You're closer to death today than you were yesterday. And no matter where you are in life, as we go through life, we're all fighting the battle of the bees. What are the battle of the bees? Bunions, bulges, bifocals, baldness. We all fight it. We're deteriorating. We live in a sinful, fallen world. Corruption has taken place, but praise God, verse 42, a change is coming, and we will be imperishable one day with no more pain, one day with no more hurts, one day with no more broken heart, no more broken home. We can't even imagine what our future perfect body will be like. Paul says in verse 43, it's just glory. And then he says in verse 43, it'll be a spiritual body, like the change that happens when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Or, or, or maybe, ladies, think of a diamond. You might have a diamond on your hand. You, you might have got a diamond for Valentine's Day. Well, ain't you lucky. Maybe you got engaged. I was talking with a couple that got engaged here recently. Or think back to the time maybe when your husband proposed and he gave you that diamond. Do you know what a diamond is? A diamond is made of carbon. That's the same thing coal is made of. Think of an old, black, messy lump of coal and then look at a diamond. What's the difference? The carbon has been changed. Someone once said that 
Coal is carbon in humiliation. A diamond is carbon in glory. That's what Paul's talking about. Right now, because of sin, we are in humiliation. Our body is perishable. But one day, he says, we will be raised in glory. We will be raised in power. One day, we will have a spiritual body. You see, the basic problem is most people, even Christian people, have been bombarded with this idea that man has been progressing, that we're getting better. Even Christian people have bought, to some degree, this theory of evolution. Can I remind you, it's just a theory, by the way, and the Bible does not teach it, and they think that in some way, man's been getting better. He's been improving. He's been evolving, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches just the opposite. Man started out as a glorious creature in perfect surroundings in the Garden of Eden, but he sinned, and as a result, sin entered the world, and as a result, pain and disfigurement came. People say today, we are all made in the image of God. No, we're not. Adam was made in the image of God. Do you think God is in this shape? Look at the person next to you. We're not made in the image of God today. Adam was created perfect in the image of God, but mankind fell. Now, I understand what people are talking about when they say that. There's a hint of it. But because of sin, we've been scarred. We've been hurt. We're perishable, verse 43. We're weak, verse 43. We're natural, verse 43. But the good news is Paul is saying there is going to come a day where God will give us a brand new glorified body in heaven. But don't be confused. You will be you. I will be me. We will know one another. Number one, it's a mystery. Number two, it's a miracle. Number three, it's instantaneous. Look at verse 52. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. We believe in what's called the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of God's Word, that every word in this book is inerrant. Why did he say twinkling instead of blinking? You know, scientists have told us you can measure the blinking of an eye. It's point zero 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 whatever, one of a second. But how do you measure the twink in a flash? It's instantaneous. Number four, it's victory. Look at verse 52. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And when this happens, the saying, verse 54, that it's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says about the turn of Jesus, number five, it could happen at any moment. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, it'll be like a thief in the night. Three times in the last book, in the last chapter of the Bible, three times Jesus said, I'm coming soon. Any moment, the trumpet of God would sound, and at that moment, believers would be caught up together, be raptured up together to meet the Lord in the air. Can you imagine if it was today? Can you imagine if God had determined that February 16th, 2020 would be the day that he would say to Jesus, go get my children, would be the day that he would say to Gabriel, get your trumpet ready. As a matter of fact, can you imagine if it was one minute from right now? You got one minute, Jesus is coming back. Do you know you're going to be with church and you've got less than 10 seconds and Jesus is going to return? Five, four, three, two, one. Would you still be here? Do you know? Because the amount of people that are listening or watching me right now, I have no doubt a big majority of us would be with Jesus. Because years ago, you nailed down a commitment to him. But if that had been Gabriel's trumpet, instead of Charles's trumpet, would you be left behind? Do you know? 
You say, well, I'm pretty sure. I'm kind of sure. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, did you know that you know that you know you'd be in heaven? If not, settle it today because number two, the time to prepare for heaven is now. It's now. He says in 2 Corinthians 6 on your handout, I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Listen, today is your day. God has brought you here. You're watching this right now. And God loves you. And he wants you to know him. Not just about him intellectually. He wants you to have a relationship with him. Have you ever nailed it down once and for all? If not, friend, today's your day. How do I do that? It's not necessarily the words I say, but I express the desire of my heart to God. Through that, just maybe silently, you just say, God, I need you. God, come into my life. Forgive me. I repent of my sin. I believe Jesus died. He was buried. He rose from the dead for me. I want to know you. And then look what he says, if you've done that. If you say, well, Pastor Kevin, I remember I did that. It was maybe weeks ago, maybe months ago, maybe years ago. And I know that I know. Then verse 58, therefore, what do I do while I'm getting ready for heaven? How do I get ready? Because it's a long trip. How do I get ready for heaven? Look what he says. A, I live with purpose. Stand firm. I live with purpose. B, I live with confidence. Let nothing move you. That's what faith is. That's what hope is. It's a confident expectation. It's being sure. It's being certain. I live with purpose. I live with confidence. And then C, I live to serve. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. If I know, if I've settled it, I, I grow in my faith. And one of the ways I grow is by serving others. I live to serve. And then D, I live with joy. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He's saying, whatever you do in my name counts. Jesus said once, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, it counts. It's like you actually did it to me. The time to prepare for heaven is now. And no matter what, where's it all begin? Where's it all start? Look what he says. Therefore, my dear brothers, E, you live with Jesus. That's where it starts. You know that you have Jesus. You know that you're part of his family. So let me ask you, number one, do you know for sure you'll be in heaven one day? You say, well, Pastor Kevin, this is pretty heavy today. This is serious. I've been to five. We've had five deaths in the church this week. Most of them most of them were totally unexpected. One day you and I will change and we will leave this earth. It will either happen through death or it will happen through the return of Jesus. Do you know for sure, God forbid, you get in a vehicle, you leave this campus and you get out on the road and God forbid, your life is cut short. Do you know your eternal destiny? Everybody believes something about heaven. If you'd say, well, Pastor Kevin, I know I'm going to heaven. I made that decision years ago, but to be honest, I really hadn't been living for him. I've gotten off that straight and narrow. Listen, today, friend, is a day that you need to renew your faith. Is a day you need to rededicate your faith. There's a great verse in Isaiah, with open arms, I welcome you back. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, God's loving arms are open for you today. Come back to him. Come back to him. If you truly know him, come back to him. But do you really know that you know that you know? You see some of you today while you're walking out to your car here in a few minutes you need to say to the person that you come with, do you know? 
Some of you are going to see somebody this afternoon. Somebody are you going to go to work tomorrow with someone, and you're not trying to judge them. You don't think you're better than them, but you've got your questions. You've got your doubts, and you need to say to them, do you know? And then maybe you need to use the back of the bulletin so they can know how they're going to heaven one day. You'd say, well, Pastor Kevin, I know. I know. I know. Then let me ask you, fellow Christian number two, are you prepared for heaven? Have you been changed? Changed. 